As a preliminary... There we go. Thanks, Maria. That's all right. As a preliminary matter, this is Denise Cronow, Chair of the Finance Committee. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. And starting with Peter Schaefer. Aye. Chris Glowacki. Aye. Jill Beef. Aye. Joe Grouse. Aye. Thank you. Uh, staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative and in the order in which I see you, Brian Turbot. In attendance. Maria Basheva. Here. Rick Sears. Here. Good, thank you. Okay, good afternoon. This open meeting of the Finance Committee is being conducted remotely pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. For this meeting of the Finance Committee, we are convening by video conference on the Zoom app, uh, which is posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that the meeting is being recorded and that all attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and to take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. Uh, turning to the first item on the agenda, but before I do so, uh, allow me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. I will introduce each speaker. After they conclude, I'll ask the committee uh, to provide any comment, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Uh, also remember to mute your phone or computer when you're not speaking, and please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. Um, and each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by roll call vote. And I still have my dog to take out. So when my screen goes black, Stephen magically becomes the chair. It's magic. So there we go. All right, uh, call to order. We've had the video announcement. May I have approval of the agenda, please? So moved. I moved. And second, thank you. Okay, uh, Peter. Hi. Chris. Hi. Jill. Hi. Joe. Hi. Stephen. Hi. George. Hi. Thank you. Okay. Um, public comment. If you have a public comment, please raise your little electronic hand. No electronic hands. Okay. I'm closing the public comment. Uh, are there any changes to the minutes of February 22nd or February 24th. Joe? Uh, it seemed to me that on the minutes of February 22nd, I'll just find, I'll find my little, no, sorry, it wasn't the 22nd, it was the 24th. Um, on page two of seven, art, uh, number three, it looks like the, um, motion and discussion under number three, article 12, is actually the motion and discussion copied over from article 11 above it. Okay, so let's hold off on the 24th and get that corrected and do it next time. Um, so let's just do the 22nd today. Yep. Thanks, Joe, I didn't catch that. Any changes to the minutes from the 22nd? Seeing none, may I have a motion to approve? So moved. Thank you. Second. 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 Thank you. Peter. Aye. Chris. Aye. Jill. Aye. Joe. Aye. Stephen. Aye. Joanna. Aye. George. Aye. Denise, aye. Thank you. Okay. Um, next item on the agenda is the potential adoption of motion article 79 home rule petition and act prohibiting the application of fertilizer in the town of Nantucket. I sent all of you the town council's suggested motion. Uh, Maria, is it possible for you to put that up on the screen? I'm sorry, I should have asked you ahead of time if you could do this. Article 79, right? Correct. It's the, it's actually the John Giorgio um, comment that he just sent to us last week. So he, let's see, not standing, is that it? No, that's not it. For the fertilizer? 
Yes, he, um, John sent us, and. Denise, I think that is it. It's just in the it? Okay, let me, okay. Whatever it he said. It, is, it seemed longer, the one I had, sorry. <laughs> I'll double check it while you're moving on. Yeah, the, I, the version I had just somehow seemed like there was more words, sorry. I copy pasted from the email you forwarded to me, so. Okay, then that's it. Thank you, Maria. Sorry. It just, no, no, I'm fine. Okay. So it's really the be enacted by the Senate and the House of Representatives and General Court assembled by the authority of same as follows, that section. Okay, yep. I was reading the um, shorter part up front. Okay, sorry, everybody. Keeping track of this stuff. Maria is so much better at it than I am, I'll tell you. Any comments from um, I know everyone probably read it when we sent it out last week. What this basically does is just ask for an extension for them to be able to modify any rules that they have or regulations that they currently have that the deadline has already passed on. So it gives the MP and EDC plus the University of Manhurt Massachusetts, Manhurst, I just changed it, University of Massachusetts Amherst extension, uh, the ability to come up with potentially more or less, or come up with new legislation or uh, bylaws in respect of fertilizer than we have currently today. Uh, Denise? Yes, Joe. Just, I'm just, I, I, I don't know, I don't think John George is on the call, but so, okay, so the, the section one language basically says that the time frame for comments is gonna be extended by two years after the effective date of this act. Has the, has the act not been made effective yet? Because the only date in this paragraph is 2012, which seems to me an extra two years is still well past. So I- My understanding is section one is the new act. So it'll be two years past this new act, but again, Libby, maybe I'm gonna jump over to you and- oh, Just stand by a minute, I'm pulling up this email. Okay. I think, I think the preamble says that we're making changes to the text. Right, make constructive right. changes to the text hereof. Mm -hmm. Right. So- it's, I, I was just confused by the fact that the only date in, in this, you know, text is 2012 i didn't know so that there's a some other newer due date other more current date that this um act is going to go into effect and then there is two years beyond that for the uh university of mass and the npe and the the plant in the town in effect to propose potentially stricter regulations on the use of nutrients and fertilizers is that is that the way to understand it that was, how, that was how I understood it, uh, Joe, um, yeah. and that it was, so that was my understanding of it. It's, of course, as you read it, it takes a certain amount of thinking to figure that out. <laughs> Jill? I thought that this expired in 2014 or something like that. It did. I mean, we're, but we're just saying, oh, well, we want you to reopen it, but right yes basically it expired in 2014 we missed the debt wait well we uh the deadline's come and gone and we would like the deadline to be extended another two years starting now so then that way nantucket has an opportunity to do something about this that they missed in 2014 but did we miss something 2014 or did the best management practices go into effect as a result of this from 2012? Well, I think the whole point of this is that, and again, I'm happy to be corrected by anyone on this Zoom meeting. When Mr. Manella put in the ban it entirely, 
there was a premise that the the rules should be changed, if you will, ban it entirely. And so therefore, rather than banning it entirely, potentially there is a way to tighten up the best management practices, the enforcement, et cetera, et cetera. And so therefore, let us please have another shot at this rather than going to ban it entirely. This was to as kind of a compromise to say, we understand that there's potentially things that need to happen. And if that's the case, uh, now, it doesn't mean that anything would happen after this, to your point, maybe the best management practices that were put in place in 2012 uh, are still perfectly applicable and 2018 and 2019, I mean, they've been working on them for quite a while. Uh, however, this gives the ability to be able to do something. Libby, do you want to clarify that mess I just said? <laughs> um, I, I, I actually don't think it was that much of a mess and I think it was pretty accurate. Um, that I think the idea is that the a, a home ah. petition to outright ban fertilizers, the uh, the um, the likelihood of passage of that is low, is believed to be low. So the way to um, work it out is to have the NP and EDC re revisit its um, adoption of this. Um, UMass plan that is outlined in Chapter 262 of the Acts of 2012. And um, like you said, Denise, that requires, um, that seems to require some special legislation. I, I'm trying to, I'm sorry, I'm trying to read Town Council's email and the uh, article all at one time and not having had a chance to prepare for this after having been at a completely separate unrelated workshop all day. I, um, no problems, Libby. As you can see, I am prepared for it and it's still, I am hardly leading from the front on this. So no, I, th I think you said it accurately though. Yeah. Banning's not going to get anywhere. It's prob It's most very, very unlikely that the attorney general will pass it. If Nantucket wants to be stricter, the only way we're going to get to be stricter is if we get the authority to work on it for a couple more years. And this is this act would give us that authority if it was to pass. Correct. That's that's the plain English version. <laughs> that's the trying to explain it to somebody version, Joanna. I was gonna agree with you, Denise. I think that you just explained it exactly right, that this doesn't do anything other than give us the opportunity to figure out what to do. Okay. So I move to adopt. I second. Okay, any further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, okay. Uh, Maria, if you can take it off so I can do roll call and catch everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. Peter. Aye. Chris. I voted with a minority, so I think, what do I do, abstain? I don't think I should be voting on the comment. Mm -hmm. I'll abstain. Okay, well, thank you. I think this is our motion, isn't it? Or, this is our motion. No, though, we didn't President. vote yet. Oh, I thought we, I thought we already voted the motion, then we're gonna- um, No, do we the didn't comment. vote the okay. motion. Thank you, um, no. Okay, uh, Jill? Uh, I'm a no. Okay. I need to keep track of no's and yeses. One yes, two no's. Okay. Um, Joe. Aye. Stephen. Aye. Joanna. Aye. Okay. George. Aye. Okay. Denise, aye. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, review and discussion of the Human Services Contract Review Committee report. And I see that Dorothy is here with us. So um, does uh, Libby or Brian, do you want to say anything in advance of letting Dorothy take the stage? And I see shaking of heads, no. So Dorothy, over to you, please. Madam Chair, I'm out for this one. Oh yes, um, and actually Jill is as well, so. Hi everybody. Oh, just to be, Dorothy, before you, you speak, um, yeah, just to be formal about it, uh, both Jill and Chris have to recuse for the hospital and the artist associations of Nantucket. So they will be recused from the discussion on article nine. Okay, good. 
Um, okay. and, Go ahead, Dorothy. We had two grants this year. Um, again, one is the human service grant and the other is the cannabis grant. And I'll talk a little bit about the cannabis grant first and then I'll do the human service grant. We had, at, at the beginning, we had three programs um, apply. One ended up pulling out after, um, at the end of the process. They were Fair Winds with a peer recovery program, um, Gosnold with a SOAP program, and Dr. Lepre with Addiction Solutions. Dr. Lepre's program is the one that pulled out. Um, and so in the, what we will wanna say for the committee is that we believe that all three of these programs are vital to the island and in the process of recovery. Um, without all three of them working together um, or separately as people will have their own path to recovery, um, having these three available is really a, a great beginning for the island community. Um, so the programs that we are, suggest we are giving is we have taken the $175,000 and we thank you very much for that huge increase. It was um, much appreciated by everybody on the board. Um, is that we are funding, making the recommendation to fund a peer recovery program put on by Fair Winds. And the peer recovery program, in short, is a um, based with people that have had or, or have successfully made it through recovery, working with people in the process of recovery. Um, they are trained in a clinic and then overseen by a therapist um, throughout the process. Um, and the other program is the SOAP program, which is done at Gosnold. Um, and I think everybody probably has an idea what Gosnold is. It's a recovery program on the Cape with a long history of um, success in the, in the recovery area. They started with the first year's grant of the cannabis. Um, they opened their doors February 1st. So we don't have enough um, information to let you know how that program is actually, whether it succeeded or not, but we believe it's important as any program, it needs time to develop. And this is such a great opportunity for the island. So the SOAP program offers um, sessions about three and a half hours a day for three to five days for individuals. Um, and they're both, they're done during the day and it helps them with the basic steps of getting back into um, the community living. And this is usually done after somebody comes out of treatment programs and it's uh, management for relapse prevention. It's uh, acute you know, um, addiction withdrawal syndrome, working with patients on that. It's the 12 step or orientation and it works um, on the, neuro the neurobiology of addiction. Um, and also helps people that are in the medica um, medication assisted treatment program or programs. Um, it usually, as I stated, it runs about eight weeks and it helps people on that step. There's always that step. Some people have an opportunity for a halfway house. We don't have that here. This is basically what some of those skills of a halfway house teach you on getting back into the community. So um, when Dr. Lepre pulled the recommendations of our committee are that we split the 175,000 down the middle for both of the programs. Um, we believe that both of them can make a huge difference in the island community. Um, are there any questions on that one? Uh, Peter, thank you, Dorothy. Peter? Dorothy, do you have any idea why Tim pulled out? Uh, yes, uh, Tim could, his financials, he could not put, pro provide for us tax returns and or uh, budgetary items that are required within the process. Um, and I reached out to him quite a few times to try to get that documentation. And he finally just said he didn't have time and he asked to be pulled. Will he still be running his uh, service? Yes, he will. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. Other questions for Dorothy? Dorothy, um... Is Gosnold on island, physically on island? Uh, yes, they are. They opened up and they reopened their office. They're there three days a week, Tuesday, Thursday, Fridays, um, providing they have a clinician that comes over that is a licensed um, 
I think it's LSW, licensed social worker, and he has one other thing behind him. I'm sorry, I'm not quite sure what it is. Um, and the Gosnold office is actually has ASAP in it as the, they're in the office because NAMI took over ASAP. So they're in the office, the other two, the, you know, the office has somebody in it now five days a week. Um, and they are able to see patients or, you know, be a go-to for people to go in and find out about programs through NAMI as well. Um, and he comes in the morning. It is an off-island clinician that comes three days a week. Uh, they offer telehealth too. They've had constant telehealth, got Gosnold has on the island and still has the emergency con, um, contract at the hospital and has one therapist here that sees patients. Um, and so they, it took them like five months to find somebody that wanted to come and do this, which is huge. Um, and we're really hoping that it, it works. And they have the ability for telehealth with um, psychiatry too, which is huge. Now, um, so the 87,500 will serve how many people? Um, it will depend on how many people get in the program. So what would be the capacity if it was 100% subscribed? Let me ask it that way. Um, you can get four to 10 people per session. Um, and so if that... And I think the big thing that, um, and I put this in my other report, is um, we look at, we tend to look at human services about how many people you actually serve, where, where really we should be looking at the outcomes. And you, you can look at saying, oh, we're going to serve, you know, this program will serve 100 people, but in serving the 100, is your outcome really what you want? Or is there a good outcome from the program? And this program has a high percentage of, outcome, of positive outcomes. And even if we only serve, I mean, even if it only serves 20 people, 50, 30 people, those are 30 people that would not, the cost of um, halfway houses, three quarter houses, these kind of programs, the cost of not being able to live here, I can tell you it can run you uh, you know, close to $200,000 to get a successful program under your belt and make it. And we're here, this program's here, and it has the ability to offer to this community, even, you know, for parents that need to come back, for kids that need to come back, something that we've never had here before. And, and what is their, you said they have a high percentage of success. What is that percentage? It's 87%. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions for Dorothy on this? Okay. Thank you, Dorothy. If you want to go to then the main report, please. Yep. Um, so most of you know all these organizations, so I will not go through most of the summaries of who the organizations are to save time. Um, but I will say that one of the new ones that you will see in here, Anami is in here this year um, again. Um, but they have a different program that we are looking at and funding, which is, um, it is therapeutic care provided by, they have nine uh, private clinicians on the island providing sliding scale therapeutic care to island residents. Um, and most of them are seeing nine to 10 patients apiece. Um, they started this program on a grant on their own last year and are now came to the town for assistance and having the grant go through on the second year. Um, and that is our, that's the one new program that we're looking at this year as far as context of services being delivered to the island. The rest are um, the same services that we have seen. Uh, I would say that Small Friends is actually um, a summer program is helping with their summer program versus their after school program um, because they still are limited on their staff capacity or staff, which has limited them on their capacity. They've gone from 69 students to only being able to have 39 uh, children participating in the program at the time, at this time. So that's the only other thing that's changed. Um, in the recommendations, you will see that we did not uh, make any recommendation of funding for Nantucket Cottage Hospital. 
which is the first time in a couple of years that we did not. And um, if you would like me to explain why, I would be more than happy to explain why. Yes, please, Dorothy. Okay. Um, so it came to our attention that during fiscal year 2021 and fiscal year 2022, under the Department of, me, I want to get this, say this right. Um, it's not the Department of Health. Um, give me a minute because I'm drawing a blank for a minute here. I'll get back to the name of the department. There was monies put in their um, budget under Section 4000-300, which allotted money to ambulatory services for Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard. Um, and we went and asked about whether or not they had use that money, we came to find out that actually they had in 2021, they did not know it was available in 2022. Um, but in our discussions also came up about insurance. And were, did they have insurance that backed this up? Was this program ever have insurance back it up? And have they ever applied for other grants to fund this? And one of the disturbing things was that we couldn't, nobody could give us a solid answer. I sat with the, well, I did get a solid answer after a while. I sat with one of the finance directors asking, you know, they put in their grant about um, ambulatory service, about the steamship authority. And what we saw was that basically bookkeeping 101 wasn't being taken care of. They could not say to me if an ambulatory service went out on January 1st, the steamship authority bill for January 1st was also related to that. Um, and so we, we started looking a little further and asked about insurance. So what we found out is that coastal ambulatory service, which they have highly uh, high regard for because they do come where they had problems with the last one, actually can, can bill the patient as well. So let's say there's a trip going, and I'm just coming up with a random number, um, going to Worcester, and it's costing $4,700 for us to ship somebody to Worcester, Coastal can actually charge the insurance of the patient going as well. And we had never been told that. Um, uh, and also we were waiting. And so that sort of brought up a big red flag as to how much were they working and working to get funding other places? Um, why weren't we told that that was part of their contract? Because we have, you know, taken on a, that's a huge amount of our human service budget that goes to this program. And was it the right fit? And was the hospital doing as every other organization does in pursuing as many grants as possible? Were they doing it? Um, and they were not. So, with all those factors in place and we couldn't get answers as to you're telling me one minute they told me that they had no idea about the money by the afternoon they knew about it um and then the question on insurance did you know where insurance was uh, did you understand that yes we knew that well how come that was never presented to us um and so i think i can say that we really felt that we gave them a lot of time to come up with answers and so that we could support or not support. And all in all, the end result is that it is not, we don't believe it's a sound financial move for the town to put the money there when we can put it in places where people are working really hard for all the money they're getting into the, their programs. Questions for Dorothy? Peter? Just one quick, Dorothy, what department at the hospital is responsible for getting that information to you? Well, we went to the social service department, which is, it's funny, she writes the grant, but we also talked to the, to the finance department. And when I first sat down with the finance department um, and asked questions, they didn't really have the answers. And then I spoke to it, a new woman, her name is Sandy, and she oversees um, the social service department. Um, and she was unable to give me that answer and then said it was, but said to me about the insurance with ambulances that that was common practice within hospitals. Um, and we have never known that as a group, or I don't think the town ever knew that, that the ambulance service was also able to bill out. And 
finding out that they don't actually go after any other grant for this um, was upsetting because we have people that fight to really work hard on writing as many grants as possible to get funding for, for this um, itself. So it was basically social service and finance department is who I spoke with. Thanks, sad. It is sad, we agree. Chris, you're recused, so I'm not sure you can actually, I'm gonna ask Libby. Um, I, I just didn't know if you're taking public comment, I would speak as a member of the public, not and on behalf of the hospital, not uh, as a board member, but if not, I understand. Okay, let me let me at least go through the rest of the committee members and then we'll I'll, I'll get a re reading from Libby and then come back to you, Chris. Thank you. They help, you know, it's all this time and I still can't get the mute and unmute right. Joanna. Thank you. Um, I will first, I just want to acknowledge Dorothy and the other committee members who are on this call, which would be Ruthie and Brooke. Um, because this was a lot of time and a lot of information for us to um, review as some of the other FinCom members who have done this job before, well, no. Um, but I, I wanted to share a couple of comments about this process because I know that there's just a few nuances that I think are important. One of which is that with regard to the cannabis grant, I think you should all know that had Dr. Lepery been able to provide the financials we would have funded his project fully. He just wasn't able to provide the financials. And so as kind of default, we gave the money to Gosnold, but we had a lot of concerns about Gosnold. So I wanted you to all know that. And then I think in terms of um, the same thing with the larger grant, the, it, the NAMI wouldn't have gotten as much money had they gotten uh, because we didn't fund the hospital, we were able to give them more money. And some of that conversation was really around the fact that NAMI doesn't take insurance, right? So there's a lot of nuances and Dorothy brings a lot of years of experience and perspective to this. And the thing about the cannabis grant in Gosnold is that it does provide a type of service that isn't available on the island. It may serve less people, but that service isn't available. The NAMI issue really is about taking insurance, right? Um, now I'm going to get to the hospital, right? So uh, the piece about the hospital, in my opinion, is had the presentation we had with the hospital led with the I, things that Dorothy had identified, the conversation could have gone entirely different. They could have said, we apply for this money from the state and we're going to get this much. Here's what we know about how Coastal Ambulance gets reimbursed. And that didn't happen. Right. So it was Dorothy and also Brooke who did some research and found out that these discrepancies existed. And um, I think the other thing that's really important to know is there was nobody on our committee who does not think that ambulatory care. Right. Is is not important. Right. And the first year, because I was on the FinCom that we voted for this, I think you'll all recall it was around one hundred thousand dollars. It provided services for 12 people. OK, last year they provided service for 56 people. Right. So this is not a need that has been reduced. Right. It's a need that has grown. I think part of the problem is that. And I think all of you who are on the finance committee at that time are going to remember this too. We were concerned that if we funded this once, we'd be funding it forever. And it seems to be the case that the hospital didn't really go out and try to find a replacement source of funding. And not only did they not try to find a replacement source of funding, they didn't lead with the funding that they were able to find, right? And so this just leads to the question of, what's the best thing to do here, right? And so our committee made the recommendation not, not to fund. So I hope that helps. Thank you, Joanna, that helps. Uh, can I make a comment? Of course, Dorothy. Um, I, I just want to clarify something um, which has been a discrepancy. Uh, the private, on the NAMI issue, some of the private clinicians do apply for insurance backup it's just that the program does not require that you have insurance to be able to see the therapist. Some of them do get do go through the insurance process of the clinicians providing the service. It's just that the service does not 
you do not have to have insurance in order to get the therapeutic care. Thank and you. I just make that clear. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? I mean, my recollection of it, as Joanna pointed out, I remember the year that we voted to fund the ambulance. And I remember David as chair saying specifically to the people who put the article in that this was a one and done, do not come back every year. We expect you to find funding from alternative sources. Now, the people who've been on finance committee longer than I am, so Joe and Stephen, uh, just confirming that that was what happened. I mean, let me think how many years I've been on, five years. So that was about four years ago, I think. Um, and yet- no, Denise, I think you're absolutely right. You, you, part of the message we delivered was we expect you to find other funding sources and not just rely on the town's contract review committee. So. Now my other cab or agenda or attachment to that is when, um, Dorothy will help me, when Peter McKay retired and the social services department got subsumed into Nantucket Cottage Hospital, there was uh, a lot of discussion at the CRC at the time about no other hospital in the Commonwealth, and definitely not in the Partners or Brigham, whatever group it is now, um, provide social services. So that and so they were getting funding for social services, not for the ambulance. So, is it switched to be for the ambulance only, Dorothy? Because. Uh, yes, this year, this year it was, but I'm going to clarify what you just, the statement you made. Thank you. Um, the hospital, um, hospitals throughout Mass um, Partners provide social services and social, um, but they did not provide what the social service department at Nantucket Cottage Hospital provided under Peter McKay. It was a completely different program. Um, okay. He had a huge scope. So I just want to clear that up. Um, last year, we funded a little bit of the social service department. Um, this year, it was only asking for ambulatory care. Thank you. Okay, because I thought in prior years, we were funding what Peter McKay used to do, basically. Some of it, yes. Okay. Okay, Joanna? So I, if I recall, and I, I think Stephen and Joe will also maybe remember this, the first year that this came to us, it was a citizen's warrant article. Right. Subsequently, it got included into the um, contract review process, right? So the first year it came out, it was a separate thing and then it got included in. Thank you. Uh, Libby, uh, can Chris speak as a member of the public? You're my Robert's Rules expert. He's well, recused um, from voting. Yeah, I, I think as long as that, um, Disclosure has been publicly made, which I, I guess it has, Chris. Um, we will make it as he speaks. Before yeah, he speaks. No, nor, normally somebody would actually, um, but this isn't that type of meeting, leave the meeting as a panelist and come back as an attendee, but that isn't how this meeting is set up. So I was um, trying to do that with my camera. I okay. you, can, you can leave. That's me leaving. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Okay. I think, I think though you should just. I don't know, Chris, if you've actually filed the disclosure, the town clerk. Gosh, I would have. Um, in the thing we have to sign, I would have said that I work for a nonprofit and listed the nonprofit. But um, I th then I think maybe at some point you might want to do that. We can consult with town council about it. But in, in the meantime, yeah, I mean, I've I've spoken on this issue before as a, as a recused, but as a member of the panel. But it's sort of up to you. I don't have a lot to say. You know, I, but. I, I'm, I'm okay. I'm personally okay with it, Chris. Um, just, yeah, you're a member of the public now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, speaking on behalf of the hospital, not as a finance committee member. Um, I would just say, you know, we don't necessarily agree with the way some of these things have been characterized. I think uh, Joanna's right when this was brought forth two years in a row as a citizen article, what we heard the second year was, okay, this is going to be a recurring thing. It belongs in contract review. And we don't want to see this come back as a citizen article every year. That's my recollection of it. And certainly town meeting and the community has understood that this is a community issue and not a hospital issue. The hospital is holding on to folks to keep them safe um, before they need taken to an institution that provides services that the hospital doesn't uh, do. In the past, solutions like the sheriff tried to help out with using his van to, to transport these patients. 
Um, the fire department looked into, there was request into Stephen whether his guys could do it. Um, and the community certainly understood that, you know, the hospital shouldn't necessarily be on the hook for trying to having to pay to transport these patients. In terms of the insurance payment piece, insurance um, ambulance companies are one of the few medical companies that can do what they call balanced billing, which is then bill the patient for non-covered charges by insurance. But if you'll recall back when we were trying to solve this several years ago, the Behavioral Health Trust, no ambulance company would come here on that basis. We had one company that would do it and then they wouldn't come. We put an RFP for additional companies. Only one company answered the RFP. And what they said is, you guys are gonna pay. We're not going to do insurance and balance bill or we're not coming. That's how we ended up in the situation now. And we did confirm for the committee that Coastal does not balance bill. They don't bill the patients. So they'll only come if they're completely backstopped. Um, in terms of the state money, you know, we always got a certain portion of the state money. Last year, after being told that we wouldn't get any state money, or we're likely to not get any state money because a specific amount wasn't approved in the budget, we were surprised to get more than we typically got, which I would say in somewhat is a part of all the lobbying efforts we've been doing over the past five years in order to find other funding for this, which has included you know, significant um, lobbying of uh, state health and human services. Um, that amount that the state paid us last year, that increased amount, which I think was due mostly to sort of the flush of COVID funds, still didn't cover the total and the hospital covered the balance, um, which I think was about $40,000 um, of our total expenses last year. So um, obviously there can be improvement in the processes. Not everything you heard uh, wasn't true in terms of people not having the figures right away and maybe not making the best upfront presentation. Um, but anyway, I think it's important people understand all the facts and we'll see going forward um, what money can be found. Thank you, Chris. Anybody, uh, no, hang on, Dorothy. This is, you've had, frankly, Dorothy, in your committee, you've had lots of time to have all these discussions. So I actually don't want to re-adjudicate it all here. That's not the intention. Um, I let Chris speak as a member of the public. Uh, any committee questions for Chris, member of the public? No, okay. Dorothy, I, I honestly, I'm not going to go back and forth on this. So, uh, but if you have something you want to clarify, I, again, I just hear me clearly on that we're not going to debate this live at this point. Um, I know I respect not debating it. I would just say that the information given to us is not what was presented. It was not presented to us and was presented to us that they did, they were able to do the insurance billing. So clearly we're all hearing mixed messages. And I think that's what I want to say. Yeah, I think my understanding from all of this discussion is that the contract review committee, both Stephen and I, and now Joanna knows, and Jill knows the number of hours that is put into this committee. And uh, there's a clear process that you follow and a clear information gathering that you follow. And you can only make the decisions you can make with the information you're given at the time. And um, yeah, and so, you know, we defer to the committee's efforts and works in terms of where they land on their decisions because they're the ones at the coalface. I think that's, a, that's my summary of that. Um, any other questions for Dorothy at this time? No, okay, um, we, don't, we don't make our motion yet because it's not, in the, it's not the next thing on our agenda, but we'll get to it in Actually, we probably should just go ahead and make the motion on it now. So then that way, Chris and Jill can jump back in as finance committee members. Is that okay, Brian, if we jump ahead to article number nine? I'm fine with that. We can have Maria pull it up on the screen. Okay, thank you. Yep. And also the person who's on is Rachel. We um, oh, you need a last name, please. Which chart do you go to on me to pull, excuse me? I'm sorry, I was just talking with Bob. Number nine. Number nine. Thanks, Maria. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Rachel. So, Madam Chair, the, mo the motion would raise 650,000 to be appropriated from the fiscal 23 tax levy and other revenues. <clears throat> and authorize $175,000 be transferred from the Special Stabilization Fund for Substance Abuse 
in the amounts listed below and consistent with last year, we've added a note providing that 87,500 from Gosnold and 87,500 of the grant to Fairwinds shall be funded from the special uh, special stabilization fund. Okay, thank you. Denise, I make the motion to accept this as written. Thank you, Joanna. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion on the motion? Okay, in which case, roll call. Uh, Maria, I need to see the screen, thanks. <laughs> Everyone's half an inch high and I'm, I've got old eyes. <laughs> so if you can take the stop screen sharing, thank you. Uh, okay, um, Peter. Hi. Joe. Hi. Uh, Joanna. Hi. Stephen. Hi. George. Hi. Denise, aye, passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy, Brooke, Joanna, for your un unwavering efforts. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. Have a great day. Thank you. Okay, uh, Jill and Chris, welcome back. Okay. Now we are on da -da 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 -da. item number eight, article number one. Brian, over to you, please, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> so as you'll see before you, this article is to accept the receipt of the various town departments and committee reports as will be printed in the fiscal year 2020, the 2021 annual town report. Any questions or comments for Brian? So as you'll see. Brian? Seeing none, may I have a motion, please? Motion to adopt. And a second. Second. Thank you. Okay, Chris. Aye. Thank you. Um, Peter. Aye. George. Aye. Joe. Aye. Stephen. Aye. Joanna. Aye. Jill. Aye. Denise, aye. Thank you. Okay. All right. Unpaid bills, please, Brian. Number two. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. You'll see a motion before you. Um, to transfer $90,058.59 from free cash uh, to pay general fund unpaid bills. I will say that this number is extraordinarily higher than normal. Um, it's primarily a function of the turnover in the DPW and the timing of that all occurring in July. Um, so it's not something that we expect on a, a go forward basis. It's just a function of the with the director and the other administrative staff all leaving during the month of July, it created some, some difficulties within the department itself. So um, we do believe that this is a one-time event. And then there's also a, an appropriation from retained earnings for the sewer department in the amount of $391.38. Okay, thank you. Um, oh yeah. Uh, under our motion, move that $90,058.59. So that'll be nine with an I instead of a three N's in a row. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we're good. All right. Any questions about this? In which case, may I have a motion? Move. Motion to adopt. Thank you. Second. All right. Thank you. Okay. Roll call. Uh, Chris. Aye. Peter. Aye. Joe. Aye. George. Aye. Jill. Aye. Joanna. Aye. Stephen. Aye. Denise, aye. Thank you. Article 7, please, Brian. Thank you, Madam Chair. Article 7 is the personnel compensation plans for fiscal year 20 for the period of can you scroll down, Maria? Because I can't remember. I think it starts right after town meeting. Um, yeah, this will start, I believe, right after town. This is from town meeting to the town meeting for, for compensation for the outlined positions. Okay. If there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer them or the town manager yeah. can as well. Seeing no hands, I will ask for a motion. Motion to adopt. And a second. 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 Thank you, Chris. Aye. Peter. Aye. Joe. 
Aye. George. Aye. Jill. Aye. Joanna. Aye. Stephen. Aye. Denise. Aye. Thank you. Okay, we already did number nine. Motion to adopt. Uh, Eighteen, please, Brian. Thank you, Madam Chair. So. Previously, we were going to act on this article um, for PFAS soil investigation, and we had asked actually to hold it until Thursday because we thought that this might be the place to put um, potential state revolving fund appropriation relative to a water main construction. After much discussion internally, we actually don't believe the article would have allowed us to do that. So the motion is before you to appropriate the sum of $2 million to be spent by the town manager with the appropriate of the select board. For the purpose of funding, undertaking inve investigation of the presence of PFAS and other related contaminants, and I'm not going to read every bit of it, I will note that this is also contingent on a Proposition 2 and a half ballot question, which is on the May annual town election ballot as well. Thank you, Brian. Questions? Uh, Peter? Yeah, so quick, Brian, is there a lot of redundancy in this and all the other investigations that have been done? This is really a continuation of the 750,000 that we allocated last year, Peter. Um, we're moving and the airport has their own work that they're doing. So um, I don't know if there's a lot of redundancy because we're focusing on other areas than, than that. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions? Um, hold on a second, I have to scroll down. I don't see people. Okay. Yeah, we can take the motion down now, I think, right? We think so. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? No, may I have a motion? I'll move. Motion to adopt. And a second. Second. Thank you. Uh, Chris? Aye. Peter? Aye. Joe? Aye. George? Aye. Jill? Aye. Joanna? Aye. Stephen? Stephen is frozen. Stephen is frozen. Okay. Denise, aye. Okay, thank you. All right, 22, Enterprise Funds Capital Expenditures. Um, really oh, okay. okay. <clears throat> um, so Madam Chair, um, before we get too far into this, I will note that um, this motion before you does exclude two capital articles, as you would note, the FinCom would note in their report from the Capital Program Committee, there were two articles that were not, um, or two projects that were not recommended by Capcom. One was uh, for 1,152,000 for design and OPM services for the construction of employee housing. And the other was for a berm to be constructed um, at the airport. We sent to you today some information relative to our understanding of why Captain is reluctant to approve those with some responses from the airport as well as some um, schedules and tables. Um, I think that the airport is here and would like to um, ask for consideration for those to be included. Um, town administration had talked about including them but felt that it was appropriate to leave them out based on the hard work that the Capcom did and allow the and have the airport come and talk to you about whether you would like to include them in the appropriation. I will note, um, we did try to get the cap, the chair of the Capcom here. Um, I will tell you that he, he wasn't able to make it, but in his conversation with the assistant finance director, if the finance committee, if the finance committee felt inclined to include them that he would not argue or stand in the way of that. Thank you, Brian. So let me just be clear on the process before we uh, invite Tom, uh, Mr. Rafter to speak. And I also have a question for Jill before we do that. Um, so the if the Finance Committee was so inclined to say, yes, it's, it's for housing, housing is urgent. And whilst I believe one of the reasons that it didn't pass, um, it didn't get Capcom's endorsement was because of the cost per square foot. Uh, of the original proposal, um, if we wanted to include it, then do you rewrite this tonight? We've already. So, Madam Chair, if you were so inclined to include those two projects, 
-hmm. we are we have a motion constructed with those both in it for your review okay thank you Jill, do you want to just, uh, as the representative on Capcom, do you want to just give us a little bit of background? Could you be Stephen Welsh for me for a few minutes? That's what I'm asking you. And uh... oh, <laughs> Well, actually, the explanation that Brian sent around was pretty good. I mean, we, we all just felt like originally with the money they asked, it seemed like a lot of money. Um, $800 per square foot is a lot of money um, for building project. And at the time, Tucker Holland was on and the Capcom asked Tucker, was that too high based on the numbers he's been running every day, all day for money that taxpayers are already uh, funding for housing, which I would hope would meet some of the needs that the airport's talking about, to be honest with you, because we're talking about police, fire, you know, it's not just airport um, employees. So it, it's supportive staff to the airport. You know, it, I don't want to separate the two too much, but anyway, Tucker agreed that that number was really high. Um, the other issue that we had, and Tom will probably come back on this, but uh, originally they wanted duplexes. Then they said they needed a single family home. And so it seemed like maybe they weren't completely firm on what it is that they wanted. Now, I do understand that they can't go out and buy a property somewhere else. Um, they can give stipends to employees, I believe, to help subsidize their housing, but they can't just go buy someone a house. You know, they don't have that, that, that legal authority. So I know that they need housing, but it seemed like it still wasn't quite firm to me who exactly they needed it for. And the other issue that came up is, you know, they're basically saying they're going to lease it back to the town. So not only do we not own the land and not only are we going to pay for it, but now we get to lease it back. And so those were the issues that I had and I, it just wasn't settled for us at the time. Um, and that's kind of where we stood on that. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Um, any questions for Jill before we, I ask Tom to speak? Yeah. Go ahead, Stephen. Um, Jill, do you remember any of the per square foot costs that Tucker shared or that um, Capcom had available to review when he determined that $800 was, was too high? Tucker didn't give, you mean, did Tucker have a number that he was going off of? Yeah, well, uh, I guess two, two questions. Um, if you didn't have any numbers and you were relying, uh, what was, was it just on Tucker's word that this was just too high? Um, that's not, I mean, to me being in the, the field I'm in, I just sounded high to me as well. And I think other people on the committee felt the same way. Now I totally understand that they have a lot of extra, uh, I would even say burdensome regulations to build on FAA property. So I don't doubt that it is going to be a lot higher, but again, we we're spending a lot of money in my view, through uh, the acquisitions that the town's making, and we're making progress in that area that I think might meet some of these needs. But you know, we, we always need more housing, you know, so there's always you always run up against that. And if you all feel like this is something we just absolutely have to do, but this to me is it's extremely expensive. And we don't really, I, I didn't get the idea that they knew exactly who it was for, but they, they are facing some retirements. So they probably don't know who it's for either just yet. So, um, and, and I, I'd like to be corrected uh, by anybody on this call, but I think the per square foot number for the um, town employee housing dorms was $1,400 a square foot or slightly higher than that. Um, I don't recall ever seeing that, but if that's the case, then, you know. Yeah, I, I don't I think that it was shared that way, but I went and found, well, uh, we know what the appropriation is. I don't recall off the top of my head, but I do know, um, and I found after our meeting, what the size of the dormitory that the Yacht Club built down on Whalers Lane. And it's, it, it's slightly smaller than 7,000 square feet. I saw it listed somewhere at 6,000, but I think it's closer to 7,000 square feet. But it still puts the per square foot cost of over fourteen hundred dollars. 
um, which I mean, I don't disagree with you, Bill. Eight hundred dollars a square foot in the public sector will get you more than what we're likely to get out of this building. But you know, this isn't the public sector, so I just I just think people need to keep in mind what we're spending in other areas. Oh yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I to me, just it's the first year we've heard of it, and I kind of wanted to slow roll it as a committee. And we've just approved like what, $65 million in new spending. I mean, <laughs> just, does, do we draw the line somewhere? Do we not? I, I don't know. That one just struck me as sort of a newer concept and something that might take me a little bit longer to wrap my head around, even though I, I very much appreciate and, you know, the airport and what they do and they're actually, you know, a revenue source. So I, you know, I, I want them to be successful. It just was a new idea at the time. And it's one of the things that we talked about kind of earlier in the process too. Right. Um, Madam Chair, through you, can I ask a question to Brian? Uh, sure. And then Joanna, I, I see that you've raised your hand. Once Stephen's done, you should go ahead, Brian. Go ahead, please, Stephen. Um, Brian, does the airport follow the same procurement regulations as the town? Okay. They do. So, yep. so then Tom, sneak preview of my question to you when we get there. How are you building at such a better number than the town? So think about that for a second. So Thank you me. just suggested town, Tom, in addition to running the airport, is in charge of all affordable housing building. That's what I just heard you say, Stephen. Affordable housing projects. Now, Tom, okay. you. yep. Okay. That's an interesting outcome on this discussion. Joanna? My questions are similar to Stevens. What uh, what is the cost per square footage of building in general on the island? I thought it was close to seven hundred dollars anyway, right? So eight hundred dollars doesn't seem like a giant difference to me, um, especially considering by the time they actually get to construction, it'll probably be more, right? I mean, let's just face it. So I, I don't have a giant opposition to the number either. Thank you, Joanna. Okay, um, Tom. Any other questions for Jill or within the committee before I ask Tom to speak, make his case? Okay, Tom, over to you, please. Thanks for being so, here. I think everybody can agree that the cost is unknown and it's all over the map. Um, I've got documentation back to 2017 when we first started this. Um, and it came from actuals on uh, Sanctity Head Golf Course where we were looking at modeling after their project. And that was $300 a square foot back then. Um, <clears throat> where we got the five, there was a range in our model from 500 to 800. And in the technical report that I believe was sent over to you, uh, mm -hmm. our consultant had done an analysis of, and I think he used Zillow or somebody, but did a, a number of comps and broke it down in detail as to how they came up with their range. Uh, in meeting with Brian and Libby, uh, unfortunately, I was on the internet because of how they came up with the Our staff, uh, you know, got a better insight as to what was happening, and we've been in touch with Tucker all along, by the way. Um, and it was determined that, hey, you know, we need to get an OPM on board and an architect and refine what the project is actually going to be so we can get a better estimate of what the real costs are going to be. So. Uh, let me go to a couple different, I'll stay on the price point first, then I'll go back into the description of the project. So we took from the model, the high end, the 800 per square foot, and we backed into that using the percentages to get a cost for an OPM and an architect. And we had a slight uh, contingency in there. And that's what makes up the 1.1 million requests that we have. In terms of what the project actually wants to look like, as I said, we started in 2017 we put it on hold because there were a number of things happening. It looked like we were gonna get great success in other areas. Uh, but then we, we were faced with the reality of some senior management leaving and unable to fill those seats. Uh, we have since also, uh, uh, we have a commissioner that was put on board last July who is very familiar with employee housing and actually built it for his own uh, staff. So we're, we've identified him as liaison or our commission has, I'm sorry. And we're going to sit down and go through exactly what this does want to look like. It was initially two duplexes, uh, a three bedroom and two bedroom in each for a total of 10 bedrooms, two units or, or four units in two buildings. Um, we're now rethinking that it may be one 
single family. And with that in mind, then we don't know, we got to look at the calculus and say, okay, how does that impact the overall budget? We don't want to just keep adding things. So it may mean reducing it to one uh, duplex and one single family. Our objective, our next step is we're trying to um, want to obtain a, an OPM to bring them into the conversation with our commissioner, with our staff and go through and exactly refine what the details of the project are going to be. We have the site plan, we've got all the permits. Um, and Julia made a comment about leasing back to the town. Initially, when this project was first started, the FAA, we had to do a lease back to the town. And subsequently it was determined through our attorney and FAA's Washington attorney that that was not the case, that we were permitted to just build on the property. Now we would be able to make it available to certain town employees if they had emergency response to the town. Um, so I don't know if that addresses your questions or gets it more confusing or what, but um, we're simply seeking the financing or the money using our own money actually to for the 1.1 million to engage an OPM and an architect um, to, to get on board and start coming up with some concepts that we can run by our commission and have them approve or, or give guidance on what the project should be. Thank you, Tom. Um, I mean, any questions for Tom? Comments? I mean, you can understand, Tom, I'm sure, uh, why the Capital Committee was, um, let's say reluctant to approve this with so much uncertain. I mean, I if I was sitting on Capcom, I would have all the same concerns that Jill elaborated. Uh, now, you know, as time has moved on since this those initial discussions have happened, and what you're and we are assured that going through municipal procurement, that this initial money that you're requesting today leads us to believe that you will get the maximum housing you can get, I would imagine, if, if I can be so bold as to offer that you're not just going to put up a single family home and that's it, walk away from it when housing is such a crisis on this island and I'm sure is very essential for airport operations uh, to be able to offer housing for critical staff. Uh, so under that premise, I personally am more comfortable understanding why you have this request. And I also can understand why Capital Committee landed where they landed, so to speak, I hate to say that about the airport, um, at the time that they, at the time that they, yeah, you can tell it's getting very long in the finance committee cycle and I'm starting to make my own jokes here. Uh, the, where they, uh, at this point. So, you know, we have the benefit of another two months or three months past when you actually were originally at them. Um, and so that's and my thinking. If I may, Denise, one, one more thing. Um, the other, th one of the other decision points was when we look at the type of housing, um, if we're looking at senior management versus what I'll say, um, frontline staff, Sure. Our frontline staff are unionized and that must be negotiated. And the town has begun the steps working with our union to do that. And that's great. But there's a lot of unanswered questions that, you know, we, we, we still are not sure on. That was part of the decision making of, OK, well, if we build a single family, we can assign that and we can get the, you know, we we, we had the, a security coordinator um, retire a few years back. We were unable to fill that position. I put somebody into it from the existing staff and now they're retiring in June. So <laughs> a little nervous on that, but that's part of what made our, you know, trying to guide our decisions. Thank you, Tom. Questions for Tom? Reactions to what I just said? Any comments from the Finance Committee? Is the Finance Committee uh, willing to include the 1.15 million request for the OPM and architect that I see a thumbs up, two thumbs up. Peter? We have a question for Tom. To me, this sounds like it's a boiled uh, or, or makes a lot of a boilerplate modular home rather than something that has to be intricately, intricately designed by an architect. And I would think that if you went to one of the art modular home people, they could give you probably would cost you nothing. For the design. 
So I don't, I don't understand what the million dollars is, is for, for these two houses that aren't, you know, showstoppers. Well, I mean, trust me, if we're not going to, if we don't need it, we're not going to spend it. That's why we're getting the OPM on board first. Um, and again, if, if that's the case, if we can do it, we'll do it as cheap as possible. Um, but when I looked at the sanctity uh, modulars that they have for their housing, there was a level of effort from an architect that specified a number of different things. What you know, kind of gave guidance to the Huntingtons or whoever the prefabs were uh, as to exactly what they were looking for. So there was some level of effort. It wasn't a major uh, design. And that's why we would, if, you know, if we have to get an architect, we'd be looking for somebody with local experience in that type of construction. I think with the number of modulars that have been built since, and I don't know when it was built at Sankety, uh, they, they know all the rules and regulations better than anybody, so I would think, but I don't know. That's my opinion. Uh, Joe and then Brian, because I think Brian probably just, has- Just a quick comment. I think uh, to reacting to Peter's question, the, the 1.1 million is design and OPM cost for the project, which indicate that it's really more like an eight or $9 million build, right? I mean, you know, if you're dealing with multiple bed, I don't, I, I was doing some back of the envelope math. If it's 15 or 17% of the total cost for the, the OPM and the design that that backs into eight million dollars by my math. So the yeah. actual project is going to be a lot more, right? Mm -hmm. the, uh, to answer both the questions, first of all, Joe, your question: the actual build, if you look at the modeling, is only about roughly. There's included in there is the design and the OPM, as well as the construction services for OPM and. Um, architectural and engineering services through the build. So if you back out the design and OPM out of that, you're looking at about 3.8 million for the rest of the project, or just over, I'm sorry, four, seven. Yeah, it's about 4.3.7 or 4.7, excuse me, 4.6. It's 5.7 is the total project. The 6.8 that had originally been presented to Capcom was incorrect because it was counting OPM and engineering services twice. They are part of the 5.7 million in the spreadsheets that we sent to you in detail to you. So the actual build is about 4.6 million roughly minus whatever is actually for construction and engineering services. Um, and that's what seven, odd, I mean, so that's 7,100 square feet for the two buildings. Is that the kind of numbers we're talking about? Uh, ultimately, I'm fine. I, I just, I, I'm not. Um, okay. Um, to your point, though, Peter, we have to remember that there's been, I, I know that there's been an awful lot of modular homes done on the island, but that doesn't really have an impact on the town because we have to follow specific procurement law for those modular homes, which is we have to have an OPM, then you hire an architect who would lay out the site and would, do, would sketch out the general parameters of the box. And that has to go out to bid to, and they have to be qualified in this um, to be able to perform these sort of a modular home service in the Commonwealth. And so it is a little bit more, we have a little bit more hoops to jump through than the normal person that would be going and buying directly. Yeah, from yeah. But we have a lot more costs associated with it than someone else does. So we can't just go to Huntington Homes and say, hey, can you build, just build this for us here? We've got to go through a specific design set of, pro or defined set of processes to do it. And then ultimately, one of the great things about modular homes is you don't need to pay prevailing wage for whatever is constructed off site, but we will have prevailing wage costs for everything that's done on site for construction. So that will add to the cost ultimately. Thank you, Brian. Tom, did you want to say something? Yeah. One other thing to that design and why some of our costs are even higher than probably the town, we've got to meet the uh, specific environmental requirements, NEPA and MEPA, and in the permitting process for this project, which went through a master plan project, um, they were very specific as to greenhouse gas emissions, um, all energy efficiency, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, they, they said, if you're going to build it, it has to be X, Y, and Z. So that has to be included. Okay, thank you. Okay. I'm looking to see, are we including it in the capital enterprise fund capital expenditures or are we not? 
Yes, two, I see two thumbs ups for including it. Three thumbs ups, four. Okay, Jill, thank you. Okay. Um, the, so Brian. Yes, ma'am. Are there other items within the enterprise there is, um, that there you is, talk about? Yes, the, in the second part of that was a berm and Tom's gonna have to tell me where on the runway because I admittedly, Madam Chair, don't remember where on and which end of the runway. Um, but one of the reasons as noted in the in that email that we sent around that they had considered doing this was because they do have extra material from various projects. And this is a way for them to be able to utilize that material. And um, so I'll let the airport continue to speak for this, but there, I forget how much this was, Tom, was it 1.3 million, was that right? I believe that was, yeah, but again, it, that was the initial cost um, since we looked at, you know, using our own materials, it's probably just gonna be some engineering work. Okay, uh, Jill, uh, before Tom, I come to you, Jill had put her hand up. Did you want to... Are we voting on these separate or together? So um, first we have to see if we're going to include them. So we, okay. yeah, and then we'll, so we're either voting twice or three times. Yeah. yeah. I got you. Okay. But, um, okay. So Tom, did you want to explain the berm piece for us, please? Yeah. Yes, we have a um, project known as the South Apron Expansion. And it's because as you all know, in the summer, we get quite a few aircraft you can see in the picture behind me. Um, the master plan had that continuing essentially the same geometry as our existing ramp, which would have meant the edge of it ran right along the fence line, just about you know parallel down uh, Monahansett. We looked at that and said, you know, we can we can skinny that down quite a bit because of a number of reasons. One, the noise to the neighbors. Two, um, it was a little more than we thought we really needed. So now it's more of a narrower, narrower piece of pavement, about half the depth. So there's this room between the edge of pavement and the fence line, and that is parallel to Monahansett. That's where we were proposing the berm to reduce the noise. Um, I believe I attached, and Brian, I didn't see the link. I don't know if the, 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 link, didn't, the link wouldn't work, Tom. Uh, there was a link in my um, email from Virginia DOT about noise walls versus noise berms, et cetera, et cetera. And we initially looked at a noise wall, uh, thought one, it would be very unappealing. Um, and we then looked into berms and thought that we, you know, we'd be better off with that aesthetically. It, um, it, some say it works better, some say it's the same or not as good uh, in terms of results. But then what we found was we have a number of, um, we have a lot of soil when we do these projects and we've run out of space for storing the soil. So the idea was that we would start storing it and building the berm along where that uh, expanded apron will eventually be. Okay. Question, oh, Art, you wanna elaborate on the berm, please? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm Arthur Gasparo. I'm the chairman of the Airport Commission, and I very much appreciate your time, the discussion on the previous topic, as well as this topic. I would say that um, a lot of hard work I know was done by the uh, by the Capcom, but the, our chance to have some of this discussion kind of fell apart a little bit at the very end where we were ready to present. When I say we, both Tom and I, um, there was a meeting, I think that was going to be February 3rd. And then that ended up being canceled. And that was going to be part of when we were going to be able to hopefully have worked through some of these. And then there was a following meeting that was very brief and it was essentially your adopt their adoption of the recommendations. So I do think that, um, you know, you taking the time now is very much appreciated and, and, and really helps and is necessary. Um, the berm, if it, I have a screen I could share, if it would be helpful, but first I would just, if you wanted me to, um, you know, I've been working on this for the better part of 10 years in terms of airport planning, the layout plan, understanding that the, um, uh, the ramp would need to be expanded, that it may have some impacts on our community in doing so, and how we might be able to best mitigate those impacts. 
And so when we did our last um, uh, as a commission and as a community airport layout plan, that actually included a general um, uh, call for a, a noise barrier of some sort along that, that perimeter. And as um, work has developed on, on the projects over time, uh, it became apparent, I believe, that, uh, you know, a wall, we talk about a wall, I would actually you know, think about sort of what you would see going along, you know, the highway um, and starting to be some, you know, essentially the, whether it's a berm or a wall, it essentially has to be about the height of or higher than the, the height of the engines of the jets to have some, uh, you know, meaningful effect on the, you um, uh, on, on the noise propagation from, from the airport. And, um, so the, uh, the logistics, as Tom sort of mentioned about having a vertical highway type wall of 15 or 18 feet concrete or prefab and Nantucket, and you're going to shingle it, or I, what are you going to do? And, you know, all the other things that go along with that. So the berm, um, became a preferred alternative as well as we as we look to work on this. And I would mention that some of the information that may not have been available, it is 15 feet high again to try to get to that height. Uh, the airport also had engaged um, uh, technical consultants in 2019 and um, 20 to produce, to do studies. They put out acoust acoustical monitors and ran models, which we worked on as both subcommittees and commissioners um, to sort of uh, refine how they did the model. There was a lot of work that went into this. I don't want this to come across as something that sort of, um, you know, is just coming up. It's been, it's been years and it's very much in response to um, that we're going to have expansion of this area for the jet parking and we're up as an airport commission being responsive and responsible both to the community as well as to the needs of the airport and the safety and that, you know, just not providing additional jet parking. And there's a lot of discussions about that. Why, you know, and the, why, why do you have to do this? And ultimately this is um, a balance, I believe, to um, being responsible to both the community and the airport to um, service to, to, to build this. And like I say, if it would be helpful for you to, that if I shared the screen to show you the berm and the noise contours, I could do that, but I'll leave that, I'll defer to you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Arthur. Questions for Arthur? Do people want to see, uh, Brian, are you trying to say something or are you just holding your hand that way? Okay, just, just doing that, okay. Um, does anybody wanna see the berm? We all know what a berm looks like. So I guess, no, thank you, Arthur. Oh, it was, it was more of location and noise contours, but. Okay. Yeah. Peter, you want to see the. Peter, Peter, you're muted. Peter, you're muted. We know what a berm looks like, but I don't think many of us have seen 15 foot berms. Okay. So... Arthur, if you want to go ahead and share your screen, go right ahead. There we go. So. The, the, the green line, it's really, as I said, about more about the location. The green line represents the location of the, uh, of the proposed berm. And the light shaded gray area is the, um, you know, what's going to be expanded for the, for, for the jet parking. And as you can see, this is the area here where, um, where they currently park. And these other lines represent the, the noise contours. I don't want to get too wonky or technical and take too much more of your time, but you can see that by having this berm here, it essentially attenuates the propagation of those contours offsite to, to these neighbors. Um, and so that's, that, that's really it. The, 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 the actual uh, picture or view of the berm is exactly as described. It's, a, it's an earthen mound, which would be covered with vegetation. Thank you. Actually, that was pretty handy. Um, Jill. I just wanted to say that when we reviewed it at Capcom, we didn't have that study. So that's really, I think we asked for a study to see, I, I Art, maybe through Denise, you can answer, but is there only one airport that's done this? Oh, no, I don't think so. I, I mean, I, Tom could probably answer better than I, but certainly um, I believe that noise mitigation and attenuation strategies are, are common. Um, and whether it might be a berm or some places may have walls and, um, you know, it all depends on the type of project and the, the density of the neighborhoods that are immediately adjacent to, um, you know, uh, airports. Some places like Logan, they, they actually paid for East Boston, people having uh, insulation in other windows. And so there are a lot of different kind of things that have to do with airport 
operations or expansions that may, you know, also be tied to how to be, you know, um, uh, a good neighbor. That's really what it's about. Yeah, I just th didn't think that there'd been many earth berms. But anyway, that's what we were told at Capcom. And we never saw that there had been a study to show that it actually did make an effect on the decibel level. So I want to make that clear to FinCom so that they understand when they're voting, like Capcom didn't have all the information. Yeah, no, thank you, Jill. It's important. Uh, Joanna? Aren't like these types of berms like used along highways and stuff frequently, right, for the same kind of noise mm -hmm. protection? Our, think, that's a question for you, Mike or Tom. I think it depends on the area that you have. What you see, what is most um, apparent are these walls that you see because mm -hmm. they're not so good looking, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there's a lot of contour that's used when you design roads and things like that to try to minimize it to uh, the noise to neighbors. Is, is there going to be grass on this or is it dirt? Oh, no, we have to, have, for, <laughs> it's going to have to be a special type of grass, too. Now, <laughs> we have to have plantings on there because grass would be a problem with uh, FOD and d d destruction of engines. So, but yeah, there's a specific type of grass that will have to be, too. Environmental will tell us. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you, Joanna. Other questions? Okay. So let's do, uh, and Tom, what was the total number, or Brian, I'd What's the total number for the berm? Um, Rick will correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's one million three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And right. it gave me a thumbs up, Madam Chair, so I must have gotten it right. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, I had no doubt, honestly, really. Okay, so let's do this. Any other questions about the uh, OPM architect for the housing or for the berm, and I will break them up separately as to whether we're going to ask them to be included uh, in the enterprise capital um, article. So seeing no other questions, first, the first, um, I, guess, I guess we can make a motion, uh, motion to include the funding for the OPM and architect at 1.15 million, I think that's right, Brian. Uh, one million one hundred and fifty-two thousand. Sure. Fifty-two. I forgot the two. Okay, you can't have the two, Tom. I forgot it, so you can't have it. The uh, motion to include that in the fiscal year twenty twenty-three enterprise funds capital expenditures. So moved. I have a second. 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 Thank <laughs> you. And roll call. So Chris. Aye. Uh, Peter. No. Joe. Let me. Let me. Okay, yes, no, okay. Joe? Aye. Okay. George? No. Okay, Jill? I'm a no. Okay. Joanna? Aye. Stephen? Aye. Denise? Aye. Thank you. Okay, so that will be included in the article. Uh, Berm of 1.35 million motion to include the cost of the berm in the capital fiscal year 2023 enterprise funds capital expenditures article, article 22. Um, so, moved. So, so moved. Thank you. Okay. Um, I've got my yeses and nos here. Chris. Uh, can I just ask a question? Do we have time for discussion now that we have the motion? Sure. Just, just a quick question, Jill, based on what you heard, would Capcom have changed this recommendation? Oh, I, I think so. Yeah, I do. No one showed I, up to tell us that. We asked we asked these very questions and nobody was there. And I think Art would agree that's what happened. So and Tom too. So yeah. I think one of our meetings got moved and you know, I, I think um it got canceled. So it was one of those that maybe it was not the best coordination. I'm not positive, but yeah, definitely, because I the other thing that didn't come up, just so you know, is we didn't understand that the jetway was expanding. So they're going to park more jets there. So, of course, they're going to need more no noise mitigation than what they have. Um, so that is going to affect the neighborhood. So, yeah, I'm in favor of this now. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So um, with that in the second, uh, Chris. Aye. Peter. Aye. Okay. Jill. Aye. Joe? Aye. George? Aye. Joanna? Aye.
Stephen. Aye. Denise, aye. Okay. Thank you. Now, Brian, over to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Article thank 20. you very much. Tom, Arthur, thank you. Thank you. And I just, I mean, before Tom and Arthur step off, please understand that uh, we have different information that the Capitol Committee had. You know, the timing is different. As I said before, uh, we really do rely on the Capitol Committee's hard work that they do. It's, you know, it starts early in the year to get us to this point and they put in lots and lots of time. So we don't take lightly redoing this or, or making these motions now uh, in light of all the work that they did and with the understanding that we do have different information. And so, you know, many thanks to Capital Committee for everything that they do. And, um, you know, we don't want to be doing this every year, Arthur and Tom, just so you know, make sure you can get to Capital Committee next we'll year. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, now, Brian, your turn. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, before you is the Article 22, and Maria will slowly scroll through it. Um, this has added the 1,152,000 into it. Um, okay. Continue, please, Maria. Thank you. <clears throat> um, all of the rest of this uh, article does, um, does map to what was in the uh, Capital Program Committee recommendations for all the other enterprise funds, uh, not only the um, airport. Continue okay. along, please. And we'll go down to the total, unless anybody has any questions about the Capital Program Committee report and the recommendations. So sorry. Oh, good, I was afraid it was mine. I was like, oh no. <laughs> the airport total is 22,842,000. The water company has one article uh, for 200,000. Continue down, please, Maria. Uh, Ireland Home has a request for replacement generator for in shed for 145,000. Solid Waste has a substantial amount of capital this year, all funded by free cash, majority of it, 3,069,000. Keep scrolling if you would. Thank you. And then Sewer has capital in the amount of uh, 6,150,000 for total requested for all enterprise funds of $32,406,168. Thank you, Brian. And we also saw these uh, requests when we did the budget reviews with each department. That's correct, Madam Chair, as well. Thank you. Okay. Any questions for Brian on any of the other items? Joe? No? Okay. You came off mute, so I thought you might have a question. Okay. Then may I have a motion? Motion to adopt. Thank Same. you. Thank you. And that's roll why call. I came off mute. Yeah. Star. Such a star. Chris. No, cutting, in, cutting in front. Aye. <laughs> Peter. Aye. Joe. Aye. George. Aye. Uh, Stephen. Aye. Joanna. Aye. Bill. <laughs> aye. Denise, aye. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Article 33, Brian. So this, thank you, Madam Chair. So this article would be for an appropriation of the special special purpose stabilization fund for airport accrued liabilities. Um, this year, they have said that they are going to forego making a, a um, contribution into that fund. So this article has a move to take no action on it, Madam Chair. Um, they're foregoing making the contribution because? Um, because they believe they do have some retirements that they are going to utilize the retained earnings that they would have put into this fund um, to cover those rather than put money in and ask for authorization to take it out. It was a more appropriate way to do it this year, Madam Chair. Thank you. Other questions for Brian? Okay, may I have a motion? Motion to adopt. Yeah, it's second. motion to take no action. Sorry, I have to get, don't second that, please. It's motion to take no motion action. Motion to take no action. Draw my second. Thank you. I'll you second that, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is getting very long in the good and calm season. Okay, so the motion is motion to take no action, and it was seconded. And Chris? Aye. Peter? Aye. George? Aye. Joe? Aye. Joanna? Aye. Stephen. 
Aye. Jill. Aye. Good, thank you. Okay, um, next up is item nine. So Maria, could you please, I sent out the comments uh, to all of you. And if you could pull up, do you, can you pull up the comment for articles, for the articles 39 and 71? Actually, we can probably go to 11 and 16 as well. So if we start with 11. And I didn't tell Maria I was gonna do this to her, so. You know. Just, yeah, just give me a second, I apologize. I, some, my email closed for some reason. I'm gonna find them. Uh, not those, nope, nope, nope. The other ones in the one, they should be, yeah. Or do you want me to pull them up? Do you want me to? Yeah, yeah. Libby, why don't you go ahead? Because you've also got 11 and 16 too, correct, Libby? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so let's, let's start with 11. <clears throat> this is 11. So remember uh, everyone that we were talking about that it would be helpful I can't remember who made the great suggestion, apologies, that it would be helpful to elaborate more on what the money was being asked for so that people didn't think that it was just the design itself. So um, a little bit wordy, yes. However, it does uh, elaborate why the, the money is what the money is. So we first start out with the requested amount, 17%. Um, it was vetted by experts, construction costs are estimated. This is for our island home. Um, and then the request covers the fees for the owner's project manager and the design firm. And it explains the uh, legality behind it as to why uh, it has to be, why it has to be funded in this manner. And um, you can all read it and see it. And... and it'll be the same exact comment for article 16, obviously with just different numbers. And once everyone's comfortable with this, any questions? So can I have a motion to adopt this comment? We'll just do them one by one, otherwise it's messier. So moved. I may have a second. Second. Okay, Chris. Sorry about that. Aye. Thank you. Peter. Aye. Uh, Joe. Aye. Stephen. Aye. Joanna. Aye. Jill. Aye. George. Aye. Denise, aye. Thank you. Hey, Libby, if you scroll down to 16, please. It's the same comment. Uh, Yes. I, uh, but um, Brian, I just needed to um, firm up this number with you. Okay. So putting the exact number aside for a moment, it will be corrected by the time the warrant goes to print. It's the same exact comment as the last one. Except, yeah, this is different. Yeah, except the 12% is, yeah. Any questions from the Finance Committee? Seeing none, may I have a motion to adopt? So moved. A second? Second. second. Okay, Chris? Aye. Peter? Aye. Jill? Aye. Joe? Aye. George? Aye. Stephen? Aye. Joanna? Aye. Denise, aye, thank you. Okay, Libby, if, as long as you're scrolling, 39, please. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, straightforward. Okay. 
Any questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, may I have a motion? So moved. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Okay, uh, Chris. Aye. Peter. Aye. Jill. No. Okay. I'm gonna keep track now. <laughs> <laughs> I know I should do this every time. I don't know why I don't. Okay, uh, Joe. Aye. Okay. Uh, George. Aye. Thank you, Stephen. Aye. Okay, Joanna. Aye. Okay. Thank you, Denise. Aye. Okay. You no, know, Madam Chair, I'm recused on that, so I don't know if it's appropriate yeah, for me I, to vote on the uh, comment itself. Yeah, I, I, I need to. Ask you to revote that too, so I can turn. Oh yeah, sorry okay. about that. No, that's okay. I I I overlooked it. My fault. So um, Stephen and Chris are recused on this article, so we are going to revote this motion to adopt of this article's comment. Do we have to unvote it somehow, Libby? Um, I, I think you're just gonna, you're just gonna revote it. Okay, thank you. Um, so the motion is motion to adopt the finance committee comments. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Okay. Any any discussion of the motion prior? Jill, is you're the one that voted no? Is there anything you wanted changed in this comment? Oh, I just don't view them as companion articles. I think they're separate. I think that number 42 is important. I voted in favor of that. And so um, that is actually what might help give some legal recourse to homeowners if they are being sued by their neighbors. And I appreciate that one. 39 to me is just a regulatory burden. And so I'm not as interested in that right now. But, you know, it, it, that's really how I, to me, they're just not companions. That's what I'm focused on. Okay, thank you. Okay, anyone else want to add to that, otherwise we'll just vote the motion. No, okay. Um, so it's motion to adopt the comment, Peter. Aye. Uh, Jill. No. Okay, this time I can do my little tallies. Joe. Aye. George. Aye. Joanna. Aye. Denise, aye. Okay, thank you. And the last one is 71. And you know, thank you, Peter, for taking the first stab at this. And then we just tried to get it a bit briefer is how it ended up where it is. So. I'm still offering that I learned a lot about cemeteries in this warrant. <laughs> oh, there we go. Any questions or comments about the comment? Mm -hmm. In which case, may I have a motion to adopt? So moved. I may have a second. Reckon. Thank you. And Chris? Aye. Peter? Aye. Joe? Aye. George? Aye. Jill? Aye. Stephen? Aye. Joanna? Aye. Denise, aye. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And then, um, Brian, request to reopen Article 17, Appropriation School Department Athletic Facilities. Would you like to either you or so, me discuss no, that? No, I, I think I was going to do this. Um, so okay. the school, school um, the, their master plan work group has indicated that they will be coming forward with a a new number for this article. Most likely it will be ready tomorrow for a new motion. So we would need to add a lower number um, than the 15 or 16.4 million dollars that's in there. <clears throat> I believe that at a meeting last week they voted to make some changes um, to their recommendations for what would be done next year. Um, so we will we would need, a, we're asking for a motion to be able to reopen it so we can present you the new motion tomorrow for a vote prior to town meeting, Madam Chair. 
And my understanding, Brian, from what the school committee landed on was that uh, they're just taking the fields out entirely because they want to do more work with the community and education before they decide whether they're going to have a synthetic turf field or whether they're going to have a natural grass field. So they, but they still want to continue on with their 10 year, you know, this is the 10th mm -hmm. tranche of their um, school improvement playing fields master plan or whatever it's called. I, sorry, I don't have the name quite right. Um, that correct? That's my understanding as well, Madam Chair, that at this point they voted that to make the recommendation at this point that they continue with the baseball and tennis, baseball playing fields and tennis fields at Bacchus Lane and the remainder of the project be put off um, while more work is done on um, the rest of that project. So that's my understanding as well. Okay, so is um, so to that end, any questions for Brian as to why we're, we would potentially reopen this for tomorrow? If not, may I have a motion to reopen? So moved. Thank Second. you. Thank you. Chris? Aye. Uh, Peter. Aye. Joe. Aye. George. Aye. Jill. Aye. Joanna. Aye. Stephen. Aye. Denise, aye. Okay, thank you. It's thank reopened you. for tomorrow, Brian. And we will have a revised motion rewritten for you for consideration tomorrow, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Thank All you. right, everyone. Uh, we got through quite a lot today. Thank you very much. Um, tomorrow is, and Brian, we are now not going to have any motions on Thursday. That's correct. Because we did the PFAS one today. That would have been Thursday. Uh, that is correct. I think that there is going to be some discussion about Article 10 and some additions to it, but we will be prepared to discuss that with you tomorrow, Madam Chair. Okay. So tomorrow is our last day to make motions. Right. And yeah, we have a busy day tomorrow as well. Jill. Have we seen an agenda for Thursday? Did I miss that in the email? I'm sorry. No, we haven't got, I haven't, I haven't seen an agenda yet for the 10th. I don't believe. But well, we have, we have a meeting tomorrow too, though, right? Yes, we have a meeting tomorrow. Yeah, yeah we right. have an agenda for that. Yeah, but the, th the Thursday meeting is a joint meeting with FinCom, Select Board, and Capcom too, right? Oh, Capcom planning, board. Planning. planning Board. Oh, sorry. Planning Board. It and if you recall, it's to review, it's basically for the FinCom and the planning board to review their motions with the select board in advance of the select board making its comments on the 16th. So I think we did this last year. We did. did. We? Yeah. And I think like five more of a, yeah, I think it was more of a hey, select board, do you have any questions about any of the motions? That's what we did. And that was what I was hoping we were going to do again this year. Just rather than, yeah, we've made our motions. You've seen them. Anyone have any questions or want any further elaboration? So, and the reason we have this meeting is because two years ago, when we were still doing it in person, it was so much fun leaping up <laughs> to the select board who didn't sit through them. And when we spent hours on them. So yeah, yeah. So now we have this nice collaborative event on Thursday. Yay. So. <laughs> okay, all right. Tell us how you really feel, Denise. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, exactly. I'm telling you, we're getting to the end. And I'm getting, hanging on by my fingernails here. So, good. All right, everyone. Any other business before we close? Otherwise, uh, may I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. 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 Thank you. Uh, Chris. Aye. Peter. Aye. Joe. Aye. George. Aye. Jill. Aye. Joanna. Aye. Stephen. Aye. And oh, as always, thank you, Libby, Rick, Maria, Brian. Much appreciated and see you tomorrow. Aye. Good night. Good night.